Thank you everyone for coming to SF Scala uh, on this April 14th. Uh, tonight's speaker is Jeff Lewis, and he's going to be talking about it, giving an introduction to Cat's Parse. Over to you, Jeff. Perfect. Well, uh, yeah, like was said, um, I'm going to be giving a little talk here on Cat's Parse, which um, is a library that I became acquainted with at the end of last year. Um, as far as I know, Cat's Parse uh, is new as of the end of last year as well. Um, and I actually started using it because um, I, I try to be involved in open source and sometimes I'm more involved than others, but uh, I saw on Twitter that uh, HTTP 4S was part, uh, was porting their parsing of headers over from using the parboiled library over to using cat's parse. And so I got involved with that. And I, I thought I chose an easy header to do actually, because I, I chose the uh, origin header and I was thinking, oh, it's a pretty basic one, but I didn't realize that actually would include uh, like IPv6 and IPv4. So IPv4 was pretty easy, but IPv6, I was like really having to dive into uh, cat's parse and uh, learn how to use it. So it, it was a good time though. And um, and honestly, it was one of my first uh, big introductions to using uh, purely functional parsers. And I was just struck by uh, how, how powerful they are. So uh, that's kind of the background to this. And then uh, we were actually just chatting a little bit about uh, why you would choose to use cat's parse. Um, there are a lot of parsing libraries. You could search around on GitHub and probably find hundreds of them for Scala. So uh, cat's parse, uh, you know, maybe other people can jump in if there are better reasons. But from, my, uh, from where I'm standing, I think the best reasons to use cat's parse are one that it doesn't rely on uh, macros for its implementation. So a lot of parsers in Scala, they make heavy use of the Scala 2 macros, um, which was fine for Scala 2, but those are kind of end of life now with Scala 3. And so carrying your code over from Scala 2 to Scala 3, if you're relying on one of those parsing libraries is going to prove tricky. So that's why a lot of libraries have been uh, rewriting their parsers using cat's parse because it will be uh, a seamless migration over between the Scala versions. Um, and then the other thing that I love about it is uh, just that it does make heavy use of the cats library, which is something that I'm already familiar with and something I already use in my applications. So I'm not bringing in a lot of you know new dependencies or having to learn new concepts. It really does build on top of the cats ecosystem in in a helpful way. So. Uh, yeah, with that a little bit out of the way, um, we'll go ahead and jump in here. So, first of all, for anyone who is uh, you know new to this subject, I just wanted to briefly give an example of kind of what a parser is at a high level, um, and and what we're mostly familiar with, I think, in uh, the development world are JSON parsers, uh, since we we deal with that a lot with HTTP requests and such. So basically a parser is just taking a string representation of something and turning it into a more usable uh, representation such as like Scala case classes. So uh, here's an example of just like a little JSON payload that you would uh, parse into a case class. And so you'd have some sort of parser and you actually could use cat's parse for this or you could more likely use uh, a library that's you know uh, made for JSON specifically, but um, that's kind of at a really high level what parse uh, we're at uh, a parser is. Um, and then I wanted to quickly throw in the mandatory uh, cat GIF since I'm talking about some cats library. Um, and let's talk about what cats is. And I'm not going to get much into uh, category theory terms or anything like that here. I'm trying to keep this um, as accessible as possible. So I might mention them a little bit here and there. But basically, when I think about cats, I just Think of it in terms of being a library of functional programming abstractions. Um, and I'm pretty much going to leave it at that for now. Um, and really where CATS comes in, in terms of CATS parse, is in order to uh, leverage a lot of the CATS functionality for parser combinators. And um, what a parser combinator is, is basically what it sounds like, it's something that allows you to combine multiple parsers together. Uh, so an example here, if I have these parsers, P1 through P4, and I want to combine them in some sort of way, um, here and and or are examples of parser combinators. I'm able to combine P1 
and P2 using like an AND combinator uh, and then the OR as well. Um, and so when we get into more of the actual code, what that ends up looking like is this lower level here. Um, in CAS parse, you'll see this operator and we'll talk about it more as we go through. Um, but this is the product operator uh, that is used to basically AND two parsers together. And we'll talk more about what that means. And then there's an or else operator, or I believe in newer versions of cat's parse, you can actually use a single pipe character as well, instead of uh, writing or else out. Uh, but that is basically equivalent to this. So basically it allows you to treat your parsers like you would treat any good functional programming concept where you want to be able to compose things. So you're able to start with these smaller units, like these little parsers, and then you're able to compose them together to form a greater whole of a parser that you can take advantage of. So a few operators here that I'll pop up. So I already talked about the product operator, and I just wanted to throw these up there because I'm gonna use these terms throughout the talk while I'm uh, walking through some examples. So. In addition to the product operator, we also have the product right and the product left operator, which anyone familiar with uh, CATS will recognize these most likely. Um, but basically what these operators do, so product we talked about is basically an and. Um, product left and product right are similar where they're an and, except for we're essentially ignoring either the left or the right hand side, depending on which operator we're using, um, which is helpful for a few reasons that we'll, we'll cover. Um, one of them is that it simplifies the return type of our parser because we're kind of throwing away one side that we don't really care about. And the other is, as far as I understand it, there are some optimizations inside the actual uh, parsing engine that runs your parser, where if you, uh, tell it that you don't need these values, then it doesn't have to hold on to them uh, as it's parsing. So you have a little bit of an optimization there as well. Perfect, so that's just a really quick, really high level um, introduction. And um, what I'm gonna be doing from here is actually uh, taking uh, something that I worked on earlier in January um, for those of you who aren't familiar, I started this little uh, monthly Scala project that I've been posting at scalamonthly.com. Um, and in January, I did uh, a whole sort of, I call them challenges, but I guess uh, they're really just kind of projects that you can follow along with. And um, I did a whole challenge that was based on cat's parse. So this uh, talk is based off of that. So you're more than welcome to go to that website and follow along or, uh, you know, reference it after the fact. But um, I'm just going to kind of go through what I call these fundamentals, which basically it's a bunch of uh, smaller practice problems that each try to highlight a single concept of the CATS parse library. And then uh, once you're kind of through all the fundamentals, you hopefully have what you need to, to dive in and do a, a bigger project using the library. So without further ado, um, here is some code, some example, a very simple example of using cat's parse. Um, so here I just kind of represent, this is the string input that we would be putting into our parser. And this is the output that we would be expecting. So. In this case, I just created this little silt hierarchy that has um, either a zero or a one to represent a binary type. And uh, this example is if I put the, the string one in, I would expect binary dot one to come out. And so in constructing that parser, uh, you can see here that we have this parser as the return type. So um, important thing to note here is that we're not writing code that actually goes and takes an input and returns an output. We're actually just writing code that creates a parser. And from there on that parser, you can call parser.parse and pass in the input that would then parse it. So um, this is really declarative in the fact that you're not doing any parsing. You're just describing how you would parse these certain inputs into your desired output. So in this case, we are taking the either the char zero or the char one, and we are just telling it what to map that to. 
and we're combining it with that parser combinator we talked about or else. And so from that's that's literally all we have to do is, so it's very declarative. It's either we have this or else we have this and here's what we want to turn it into. And uh, from there, we would be able to parse that. Uh, so hopefully as we keep going, you'll get a little bit of an intuition of how that or else works. This example is almost too simple, but um, just shows you how that or else works. Um, this is similar, but we're going to be showing how the product operator works or that and that we talked about. Um, so in this case, we're taking a letter and a number in as input, and we would just return it as a string, but inside of this letter and number class. So you can kind of think of this as parsing and validating at the same time. But um, uh, one thing to know is there's this really great uh, import you can use uh, that's inside of the cats parse core library. It's called RFC 5234. And it basically contains a bunch of pre-built parsers for you, such as alpha or digit that cover just like you know, alpha characters, digit characters. There's also things like white space or tabs or just a lot of things that you need when you're building parsers. Um, so you'll probably be importing that into pretty much any parser that you build, at least uh, in my experience so far. Um, so yeah, in this case, we're going to be taking a letter and then a number and uh, this string, uh, operator that we're calling here just takes this and turns this into a string. If we didn't have this string here, then what the product operator actually would do is it would return this as a tuple. So we would have um, an alpha and then followed by a digit inside of a tuple. And then we would have to kind of stringify it ourselves. Whereas a string goes ahead and it collapses um, the letter and number together for us so that we can just map it directly into our case class. Um, awesome. So this example is building on the binary one that we did earlier, except for now we're being a little more ambitious and we're taking a non-empty list of those binary characters. So you can see here if we had the input 1011, we would expect to get this binary list class with a non-empty list in it um, containing 1011 of our binary types. So you can see here this binary parser right here is the same as the one that we built above. This just parses a single binary character given a zero, it'll return a zero, one, it will return a one. And then we are using this new um, operator called rep, which is short for repeat, as far as I can tell. Um, and so in this case, we're just saying this can repeat any number of times. And then this actually is really nice in that it already gives us a non-empty list as its output. And so we can just map it directly into our binary list. Um, something I should have put in the slides uh, more explicitly, but something that you'll uh, maybe think about here is what if we wanted the list to be able to be empty rather than a forced non-empty list. And that's where there's actually another operator called rep zero, which we'll see later, but that would actually return a potentially uh, empty list. So it would return a normal Scala list instead of a non-empty list. Um, and that's something to note actually is that there's a parser type in this library and there's also a parser zero type and the difference between them is if you see a parser zero, it means that it could accept an empty input, whereas a parser uh, will consume one or more characters. And if you look inside of the January Scala Monthly uh, walkthrough that I was referencing earlier, you will see there, it used to be reverse. You used to have parser one and then just parser instead of parser zero. So that actually got flipped since you end up using parser one more often than parser zero. So uh, it just made more sense to have those flip-flopped. So here is uh, the next example. And so these are starting to get a little bit more complicated, you'll see. And in some of these examples, as we move forward, I'll put um, some examples of multiple types of input that it should accept. And when you're building a parser, you also start thinking about types of input that it should not accept. Um, so we'll talk through that a little bit as well. Um, 
But here we just have a really simple um, name class. And we just want to take in someone's name and uh, the parameters I didn't write up on here because they're a little long, but the parameters for this were that the name has to start with an alpha character. So a letter of the alphabet, upper or lower case. And then it can contain uh, spaces. It can contain um, apostrophes for examples like this name here, O'Brien. Um, and I think that was all of the constraints on this one. So we're leveraging things that we have used before in the past, uh, such as the product, product operator, but then we have a new um, operator as well that we're using called one of. And this basically allows us to pass in a list of different parsers and say that it can be any one of those things in this place. So in this case, we're passing in, it can be an apostrophe, it can be an alpha character, or it can be a space. Um, and again, these alpha and space, they're both coming from that RFC import that I showed earlier. Um, so if you're not sure where something's coming from, it's probably from one of, from that import um, or just from the cats parse core import. Um, but yeah, so this one is pretty straightforward then. So we're saying it has to start with an alpha character. There has to be at least one character and it has to be alpha. And then after that, there can be um, any number of, well, I guess one or more of these characters following that. And again, we don't want this as a tuple here. We wanna just take it as a string because that's what our name class is expecting. So we just pass that string into the uh, name class by mapping over it. And um, it's probably worth noting that we do have to map over this because this, re this returns, if you take everything other than this map, it's actually returning a parser of string instead of a parser of name. So when we map, we're basically getting inside of that parser um, in order to transform its type from string to name. So if you are familiar with cats, um, I will just briefly mention that parser is a monad. And so you're able to use all of the monadic functions as well as uh, functions from functor or um, applicative with it. Uh, however, uh, you should limit your use of flat map as much as possible for performance reasons. You should rely more on like the product functions that we've been showing, um, product right, product left because of performance on that. Another thing I'll mention real quick before I go into this slide is uh, as you're going through this library, the most helpful thing that I found when I was like not sure how to do something was just to use my IDE to click into the, the different functions and look inside of the parser implementation. And it's really pretty approachable how it's been implemented because it's not making use of things like macros, um, excuse me, like other parsers uh, are like the parbol, the one we talked about or others. Uh, you're really able to follow up pretty well, especially if you have a little bit of knowledge of um, cats. And I think the whole implementation of the parser, like the, the core part of it is something like three to 4,000 lines, which sounds like a lot, but a lot of that is the actual parsing engine. And the part that you really need to look at to kind of understand what's going on is, is a lot less. So it's really pretty approachable to, to read through the, the library and what's going on. Um, so this example we have, um, we're going to be parsing out a score so like a, a score of a game of some kind uh the one team versus the other team score and so we have this simple case class uh this time we're taking these as integers rather than as strings you'll notice um and we introduce a few new operators i believe so the main one that we're using here is this product left operator that we talked about earlier uh so we start by just taking and thinking about these one piece at a time. So how would we parse this one, two, three, or this four, five, six, for example? And in general, that's, I think the best strategy for building these parsers is just thinking about the smallest piece possible and thinking, how would I parse that? And then combine them up from there. So in this case, we created a little mini parser called multi-digit, which is just gonna take in a multi-digit uh, string and it is going to uh, represent just that. So 
Uh, again, we're using digit from that RFC. We're saying that it can repeat uh, one or more times. And then we're just using that string function to go ahead and map it and turn it into an integer, uh, which we know is going to be a safe operation uh, because this digit parser will only let digits through. So we don't have to worry about that two int. I guess other than if we had cases where there could be too long of an int or something, then I'm actually not sure what that would do. But um, so that maybe that could be improved a little bit, but in general, that should work. Um, and then here we have our first example of using one of these other product operators where we're ignoring one of the sides. And the reason we're able to do that here is because this little parser here represents the space hyphen space. So you can see we're using just char to say we're expecting a char of a hyphen and it's going to be surrounded by spaces. So we could have written this like, space product char with the hyphen product space. But there's luckily this function called surrounded by that comes in handy pretty often where you have a character that's going to have uh, something on both sides. And we don't actually need that to create our score class. And that's why we're able to go ahead and just use the product left operator and basically throw away this right hand side because we don't actually need this in order to get our final result. So that does simplify what we're gonna be dealing with inside of this map. And like I mentioned earlier, I think there's a little performance optimization involved there as well. Um, and then we have our uh, last multi-digit. So we have the two multi-digits making up that parser. Um, and I also will mention something that took me a minute to understand is you will have to use parentheses a lot of times when you're using these operators that ignore one side, if we didn't have those parentheses, then we would be ignoring that entire side. So we wouldn't be getting that other multi-digit um, output. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind as your operator precedence and where those parentheses go. Um, and, and with that, uh, or I guess not with that, but one other point I wanted to make about this, uh, you'll see me use this a few times. If you're not familiar with this dot twofold call. This is something that you can do on a case class uh, to, to build a case class where you're basically saying, instead of passing into parameters one at a time into the case class, you're basically saying, I'm gonna pass in a tuple that represents this uh, case class. So I'm passing a tuple of int int instead of passing the parameters one at a time. So it's just a little bit more of a terse uh, syntax, which you know Scala developers love that terse syntax, so. All right, so this one is a little bit um, more verbose. You'll see some of these uh, examples. I really had to think how I could, uh, I tried to restrict it so that the examples would be kind of forced to use certain concepts rather than a lot of times there's a lot of different ways to do something. Um, so I was trying to come up with examples that would be almost forcing uh, using a certain concept. So that's why some of them are maybe a little bit uh, longer, even though you could have a shorter example to illustrate uh, the same thing. Um, so in this case, I created pretty much my own little tuple type, uh, you could say. It's really just two case, case classes called two and three uh, that represent just a tuple um, with either two or three values inside of it. And the reason that we're going to do this one is because we're going to show, um, let's see, this backtrack, what backtracking does. Um, so some parsers, if you've used other parsing libraries, you'll know maybe a little bit about backtracking. And a lot of parsers actually backtrack by default. So you don't actually have to put this dot backtrack anywhere because it will automatically backtrack. You actually have to tell the parser if you want it to not backtrack. Um, the reason, as far as I understand it, that cat's parse decided to have explicit backtracking is because uh, backtracking uh, by default is less performant because a lot of times you don't actually want to backtrack. And so having it where you just specify it makes it so that you're not taking the same kind of performance that you would have if it just defaulted to backtracking. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with backtracking, basically what it is, is it's telling the parser what to do when an error is encountered. So if I'm trying to parse, in this case, uh, the three tuple out and I encounter an error while I'm parsing, 
uh, such as like there isn't a third item because it's only a two tuple, then I'm telling the parser, go ahead and backtrack, basically unconsume all of the input that you consumed as a part of trying to parse this. So then it can be consumed by something else down the road. And so the reason that's necessary is because a two tuple and a three tuple look the exact same until they don't. And the parser doesn't have any way to look ahead. So it's just kind of reading along and then the parser fails. And then we tell it, if you do hit that scenario, then go ahead and backtrack, unconsume, move your cursor back, and then try to parse it with the two parser instead. Um, so I won't walk through each step of this parser specifically, uh, because I think the rest of it is just using examples that we've already covered. But that's that's really the new thing. Oh, I guess one other thing to mention is, you can see here, we are actually uh, mapping and uh, matching on this uh, tuple. So this is what I was saying. If you don't put this dot string on your parser, then it actually just spits out the items individually. So here we actually have the three items. So we have item one, item two, and item three, which I called A, B, and C here um, that we match on. Um, and the nice thing about surrounded by is that it already for you ignores the stuff that it is, it's surrounded by. So this item dot surrounded by is actually just returning an item for us. So B here is just a string, which is uh, really handy. Awesome, so here is another example of an operator we're gonna go over. This one is called soft and it's somewhat similar to backtrack in that it is telling us, or it's telling the parser rather, what to do in the event of an error. Um, the difference is uh, the backtrack example was really dealing with a, an or else parser combinator. So we are saying if there's an error happening on this side of the or else, then go ahead and backtrack and then go ahead and try to parse the rest of it. And soft is really dealing more with a composition on a using a product operator. So we'll walk through this and I'll kind of show you what I mean. Um, so first of all, we'll look at how this parser works on just this first example. Um, it's kind of what we would expect. We have basically a name, we'll ignore the soft for now, followed by a dot, which can repeat uh, zero or more times, followed by another name. And the zero or more times is because of the other example. So um, if, if this is the only name that we needed to parse, this could actually just be a normal rep rather than a rep zero. So it'd basically just be a name followed by a dot uh, repeated any number of times followed by a final name, and that would be our username. However, it gets more complicated when we need to parse uh, different types of inputs, such as a username that doesn't contain any dots. Um, and the reason for that is because what would happen if we were parsing this without this soft call right here is the parser would consume for this name it would consume the entirety of this schmidt input and then it would go and look for a dot it wouldn't find a dot and so it would fail and so that input would completely fail to parse so what the soft call does here is it allows us to say if you don't find this dot if something fails on the other side of this product operator, in other words, then unconsume the input that you consumed here. So again, it's really similar to backtracking, except for it's dealing with these uh, product operators rather than the or else operators. Um, and that allows us to, basically this whole thing ends up consuming nothing on the Schmidt case. And then this name is what ends up consuming that input. Um, and one other, oh yeah, go for it. Um, I wonder, um, maybe someone, maybe you, or maybe someone else knows some more theory on, on how to think about this, but usually uh, there's many ways to write a particular parser. So here you've written it in such a way such that you say, okay, let me try to read the name and then a dot and as many of those on the left-hand side. Um, and you've explained the, the use of soft here. And maybe this was just an example to show to show the use of this kind of soft coupling, which is a result of the non-backtracking by default. Um, but an alternative way would have been a kind of right associative way of parsing this, where you say, I'm always going to get a name, 
And then I might get, I'll get zero or more dot names on the right hand side. And then that would not incur this issue about back backtracking. And I wonder if you have any, sorry, the dog is uh, begging for my attention. Um, I wonder if you have any ideas uh, about when, uh, when you see these things, how to write them one way versus the other, what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good question. Yeah, it does. It does come back to what I was saying, where I tried really hard to think of examples where you couldn't do it both ways. But sometimes it's really hard to like, think of an example that absolutely locks you into the one implementation. Um, but yeah, in, in general, I mean, my, my preference would be towards uh, not using backtracking or soft whenever you can avoid it. Like if there's another way you can think about it, the parsers tend to be a lot simpler to, to write and to read. So um, but yeah, sometimes your brain just doesn't even want to cooperate with you and you can't think of <laughs> how to do it without. So I guess it's kind of a, a balancing act there. Um, but yeah, if anyone else has any input on that, feel free to hop in as well. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, so getting at, getting at what Oscar was saying there, um, backing up to the theory a little bit. Um, so uh, parser commenters implement uh, uh, a form of uh, sort of LL type parsing, basically. Um, with LL type parsing with sort of non-commutative OR, which gives you sort of like this, this order of choice thing. Um, and what it turns out that implements is the full set of deterministic context-free grammars. And the, the trick with deterministic context-free grammars is that um, there is a proof that by refactoring the grammar for any deterministic context-free grammar, you can refactor it down to something which is LL1. What LL1 refers to is as long as you have one token of look ahead, you can parse it without any backtracking whatsoever. So it's actually even stricter than soft, uh, where soft technically lets you sort of backtrack over like the whole thing it would be like if soft only worked on car or something like that. Um, so technically it is, assuming you don't use flat map, flat map is weird for other theoretical reasons, but like if you stick to solely applicative parsers, you can always refactor your grammar such that the only use of soft is on a car. But you will contort yourself into terrible, terrible knots. And, and just like your errors will be awful and your life will be awful. And I really, really don't recommend it. This is why people invented Yak. But like, um, it, it is actually theoretically possible to, to do without soft and backtracking if you want. That, that's really good to know. Um... Yeah, there are actually, there's actually one parser I'll have to point out in uh, the challenge side of Scholar Monthly that I could not figure out a way to do without uh, backtracking. So it'd be interesting to see if someone else can <laughs> come up with uh, a better uh, little solution than what I did. Uh, no, but appreciate the context. That's cool. Cool, I'm gonna keep going. I think there's just a couple more of these and then I was going to uh, show my IDE and go through a few examples of um, the other uh, side of the Skull Monthly Challenge that I created, so. Um, okay, so this one is actually really simple, kind of a breather from what we were working on on the other problems. Um, this example is really just to show you that you don't have to know everything beforehand like you not everything in your parser has to be static so in this case i don't even know what the allowed uh chars are going to be before creating my parser but that's okay i can go ahead and have those passed in and still create a parser so this really unlocks a huge number of possibilities for creating parsers when um, you're able to create these parsers with the, with the declarative dsl that cats parse provides and you don't have to know everything about what your parser will accept or do beforehand. So you really start to have a lot of power um, when you combine those concepts together. All right, so here is, I think this is the last, yeah, this is the last example. Um, and basically here is just showing uh, the option operator that cats parse provides. So uh, here we have just a car type, which um, supplies a make and a model where the model may or may not exist. So two possible inputs would be like Nissan Versa or just Nissan. And then we go ahead and put that into a car type. 
So you can see a lot of familiar things in this parser. Um, we have our make and our model, which are basically the same thing. We could have abstracted that little piece out, of course. Um, but the only difference is that this dot question mark says that instead of this parser returning a string, it returns an option string. And then we do a similar thing down here where this space after the make of the car may or may not exist because if the uh, model of the car isn't there, then we're not gonna have that trailing space. So um, that's why that question mark is there as well. And you'll see that we're using the product left operator because we want to go ahead and ignore that space. We don't actually care about it. We just want the make and the model as a tuple so that we can create our final car type. All right, so that is pretty much it for those fundamentals. Um, and so the January challenge that I came up with uh, is, I, I was watching the Netflix show, The Parsers Gambit, or the, <laughs> the Queen's Gambit, I should say. If it was called The Parsers Gambit, that would have been a whole different show. <laughs> That's what the challenge is called because it's basically taking uh, portable game notation from chess and and they kind of like cover it a little bit in the show it's you know not a big part of the show but uh basically it's taking that notation and building a parser for it and it's really crazy because uh you know a crack at this with cat's parse and not really trying to write it with as few lines of code as possible the whole thing was less than 100 lines of code and uh you can imagine that there's quite a few little rules to the how the portable game notation works. And um, so it was really awesome to see how Cat's Parse was able to go in and just make this whole process very simple. So I'm going to uh, share a different screen here and kind of show um, in the code what that looks like. So let me just rearrange my windows here. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger and increase the font size. All right, someone just chime in if that is still too small. But um, I'll go ahead and start by showing. So I'm not going to get into the particulars of how portable game notation works just because there's a lot to it. And if you if you want to really follow along with this, you can look at the challenge. I uh, on scholarmonthly.com I go through and outline kind of how it all works and all of that good stuff. But um, basically, this is just the model that I created. So this kind of comes out of the box in the starter code. Um, and it's just going over like the model you need. So you have ranks and files on a chessboard. That's just the rows and the columns. You have your dis different piece types that you can have on the board. Um, there are a square, which is just like a coordinate on the board. So it's like a row and a column combined or you know, file and rank rather. Um, and then it gets really interesting with uh, the notation. There are these disambiguators because when a move is recorded, you cannot always tell the difference between uh, two pieces. Uh, it would just by recording like the basic move, it's possible that two or more different pieces could have completed that move. So there's different types of disambiguators that uh, portable game notation takes advantage of. And then there are things like check status. So that's represented on there. So if you're familiar with chess, there are uh, things called checks that you keep track of on the notation. And so then we get down to like having what a move is, which is basically there are a few different types of moves. There are just your regular moves, which just capture what kind of piece did I move, what square did I end in on the move and a disambiguator if needed? I guess a few more things. So if you captured another piece as part of the move and then um, if that ended in a check as well. So that's kind of like your standard out of the box move. And then pawn moves have their own exception for how they're represented. Um, a promotion, which if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it, is a different representation. And so is a castle. So there's just all kinds of different moves. And this is why this was kind of an exciting example to use uh, cat's parse with just because there's a lot of different little exceptions. Um, and then when it comes to a turn, which is just, you know, each player making a move, 
uh, you basically have either a full turn, which is two moves, or a partial turn, because the game could end on just a single move, um, followed by finally an outcome. There are several different ways a game can end, um, and that leads us up to having this whole game. Uh, so now that you're a little bit familiar with the model, I'm going to show here, not in super great detail, other than maybe uh, in a few parts, uh, how I went ahead and built this parser. Um, and like we kind of were talking about, there's a ton of different ways you could do this. I actually saw a few other people's solutions who followed along and did this challenge. And um, they were like, you know, not completely different, but they had some significantly different I ideas and different things that they did. So. Um, but you can see I'm basically just taking each piece of the model and building a parser for that piece of the model by itself. So like, how would I parse out a file? How would I parse out a rank um, or a square, which is just, you know, like you'd imagine a file uh, followed by a rank. And then just kind of building this up through all of these different parsers to where they can start to be combined. So move is where it really starts to get kind of uh i guess gnarly compared to the other ones uh, where these ones are like pretty basic you know it's just like a mapping from one thing to another move is where we really start to combine everything together um, and this is the parser i was actually referring to a minute ago where um i wasn't entirely sure how i could make the non-pawn move parser in so a standard move i don't know why i called it non-pawn instead of standard but I wasn't really sure how I could make a standard move parser in a single uh, parser. So um, I kind of ended up with this whole mess and I'm trying to remember the whole reason, but I, I believe it was something to do with the disambiguator um, because it can look the same as a square. And so the parser, when it was a singular one, it couldn't tell the difference between if it was looking at a square or if it was looking at a disambiguator. Um, so anyway, if anyone feels uh, ambitious and wants to go look at this, uh, how to do this in a single one, it would be cool to uh, hear about that. So you can see extensive use of just everything we talked about, these option types, these product operators of different sorts. Um, and then really I tried to build up still a parser for each different move type and then say how those are all combined together um, at the end. And then ultimately we are able to uh, combine those to create a turn. Um, this is the parser for like the outcome of the game, like we talked about at the end of the model, and then it really comes together pretty simply for how you create a game in total. So it's basically just turns that repeat. And we do have to have a backtrack here because there are some uh, characters that could be consumed by turn that could actually be an outcome. Um, but basically we're just have a re repetition of a bunch of turns followed by the outcome and that's the whole game. So. That's another thing I really love about uh, cat's parse and really declarative parsers in general. A lot of the love I give cat's parse is probably uh, more fairly given to a lot of declarative parsers, but uh, I really love that you can just zoom in on one piece and kind of see what is a game made up of, and you don't have to dive in any deeper than you want to. Um, if you want to know what makes up an outcome, you can. If you want to know what makes up a turn, you can, but you really don't have to dive into those pieces unless you really want to or need to for some reason. Um, yeah, so that is sort of a, a quick high level overview, uh, followed by, you know, maybe what more realistic example looks like. I would encourage if anyone is more curious in more real world examples, go look at uh, HTTP 4S and all the parsers in there. Uh, you'll see there's a whole bunch of different examples and I think some interesting use cases. Um, and if you want to embarrass me, you can go look at the IPv6 parser and show me how it could be improved. <laughs> so uh, that was that was a fun one to build. And uh, yeah, so I think the, the overall takeaway for me is just, um, I used to honestly think that writing par parsers was super boring, but it's because I used to write them imperatively or I just kind of iterate through uh, like they teach you in school or whatever with your little C++ while loop. And um, 
uh, learning how to do it with declarative parsers is just kind of a game changer where uh, it really becomes a more manageable and approachable problem by just decomposing your parser down into little pieces and then building it up from there. So, so yeah, I think that that's all that I had. So I'll uh, open it up for questions if there are any. Any questions, anyone? On Zoom or Twitch? Great talk, uh, Jeff. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah, appreciate it. Let's see. So I wrote up some parsers using the Atoll library late, late last year, like one week before Catsparse came out or, or, or something. Is there an immediate benefit to porting them over to Catsparse? I assume this makes libraries like Atto more or less obsolete, or are there reasons to prefer one over the other in certain situations? Um, so I'm not familiar with the other parser that was referred to there. Um, like I said, there are a lot of them. So um, I would say it really depends on your use case. And I'm, again, I'm not familiar with that one, but if it does take um, advantage of using macros, it could be uh, more difficult to uh, port your project over to Scala 3. So that could be one reason to migrate. Uh, another, another reason that I liked this library, like I said, is it uh, makes heavy use of cats and those cats type classes, which I'm already familiar with. And I found it because it doesn't use macros, it's like really easy to just click into anything and see what it's doing. Uh, a lot of times if you're clicking through a library and trying to understand it and you come across some macro code, it can be kind of, um, well, it just kind of like raises the bar for what you have to do to read through and understand what's going on. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I, I think it really just depends. I would say there's no, maybe no like inherent value in doing it just for doing it. Um, but if you are looking to migrate to Scala 3 or um, whatnot, it, it could definitely be worth it. And, and honestly, like it can be pretty easy. A lot of times uh, other parsing libraries use very similar notations or or things. So it can be fairly simple to difficult depending on the differences between where you're coming from and, and cat's parse. Great. Yeah, the, the, the same uh, person asked the questions uh, saying that I don't think it's based on macros, but I don't think it's meant to be performant as primary use case. Really talking about Atto, of course, yeah? Gotcha, yeah. Yeah, so in that case, yeah. I mean, I guess you could benchmark and see if, you know, I would say my, my philosophy with performance is just if it's, if it's not a problem, it's not a problem. You know, if it is a problem, then find something that will uh, solve your problem and, and move from there. I, we were talking at the beginning of the call, um, I think it was Daniel had done a benchmark, like a kind of for fun benchmark between cat's parse and parboiled in HTTP4S to see what the difference was. And he was saying that cat's parse was a little bit slower than the parboiled implementation, but not enough for it to matter. So the fact that it doesn't rely on macros and is only a little bit slower, for me, I think for the majority of use cases, that makes it worth using. Um, but yeah, beyond that, if, if you're between two libraries that are similar performance and neither use macros, then there may not be a huge reason to migrate. Great. Uh, Stuart, you, you asked um, uh, how much production use is cats parsing? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't really know beyond the fact that it is going to be or is in the newest HTTP 4S version. I'm not sure if that's been released yet or not, but um, you know that I'm sure we'll see really widespread uh, production use pretty quickly as people upgrade there. And I know I've heard talks of it being used in some other libraries. I'm sure some more people maybe on this call or, or otherwise could speak to that better who are more involved with more uh, like a wider range of libraries, but I have seen it being talked about in a lot of places. Yeah, just, uh, Ryan Peters has put 100% agreed about performance not mattering until it matters. More interested in how Cat's Parse seems to have some momentum behind it as it just came out. I think that alone is a pretty convincing reason. Yeah, yeah, I, total, I totally agree with that. I think uh, 
the fact that it is kind of like the cat's standard parser, I think it's more likely to see a lot of support over a long period of time. So yeah, if you're looking for somewhere to go, that's probably a safe bet. I, I personally feel like cat's parse would be a pretty safe bet, especially with the implementation not being really complicated and macro heavy. If worst case scenario, if it did like stop getting supported, you could more easily support this library on your own than probably a lot of others. Ralph on Twitch is asking, will the chess example run in Scala 3? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I haven't actually tried to do it in Scala 3. Um, it should. I think the only dependency is cat's parse. So um, yeah, it should. <laughs> yeah, let me know if you do give it a try. Jaco Kubikos just said it runs. I mean, cat's parse. Yeah, he meant cat's parse runs, and not necessarily your chess application. So cool. <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> the other dependency it. I have is uh, I use mUnit for running the test. So I don't know if mUnit's uh, Scala 3 friendly or not, but you could always, you know, swap that out or something if you really wanted to port it over. I believe it is Scala 3 friendly. I believe it is. I haven't tried myself, but I believe it is. Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone on, online. Any more questions or discussions around cats for us, anyone? Is cats parts restricted to inputs of type string or can it also accept byte array? That is a good question. Um, I don't know for sure. I mean, we could actually maybe see real fast. It looks like the parse function just takes a string. So you probably would have to convert from your byte array over to a string um, prior to parsing, unless there's another function that I'm unaware of. Great. There's a slight delay with Twitch. So I'm just waiting to see if there's anyone um, for your answer to be, actually I won't heard your answer before checking if there's more questions. Any more questions, everyone? Great, oh, here we go. Uh, kind of on a similar note, I have sometimes wondered about the difference between lib libraries like cat's parse versus things like S codec. Are those two things isomorphic in some way or are, th or are there things that S codec does with binary data that is specifically not a good fit for cat's parse? That's a good question. I'm not super super familiar with uh, S codec. Um, if anyone else on the call is, feel free to build that one. But any yeah, takers for S codec? What's that? No, I, I just asked uh, if there was anyone who's familiar with S codec. Carry on, Jeff. Oh, gotcha. sorry. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say if it does have a lot of like optimizations for binary specifically, I would almost guarantee it's gonna be more performant if you are working exclusively with binary data. Like the example that I showed of working with binary and cat's parse was definitely just kind of a contrived um, thing. I like you're not gonna really have you know bit shifting or things like that uh, built in. So I, I don't know, but I would imagine you're like th this is definitely more uh, pointed towards a uh, higher level parsing, I think. Great. Pementor on Twitch has said, thanks for the talk and, and or pointing to Scala Monthly. And that was followed by, thank you for the talk by Ralph as well. Uh, Stuart uh, just asked, how about a Scala Monthly pitch? Any teasers? <laughs> um, you know, I've, uh, I've done like three of them now. So it took, took the month of April off, got, got a little bit busy, uh, last month with work and stuff, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a few fun challenges in there. So if you look at the first three, um, they cover the first one is cat's parse. The second one is going over the folds operator in Scala and kind of teaching you, uh, how to use fold on different types of collections or even on like sealed hierarchies. Um, and then the March one was uh, going over the monocle library. So talking about optics. And I realized that one was a little bit of a jump in terms of uh, 
how advanced it was. So that one is a little bit trickier uh, if you're not familiar with some of the more functional programming concepts. So I'm thinking there's going to be some coming that are a little bit more accessible than that one. Um, I'm hoping to do some on some of the CATS type classes coming up, like applicative, uh, which we talked about a bunch today, just because I feel like applicative alone, uh, you can do just a lot of really cool stuff with. So probably a little bit there. Um, and I'm hoping then to, you know, get a few more advanced ones again, like uh, Scala 3 uh, meta programming and, and stuff like that. So. So yeah, check it out. And uh, I'm very open to hearing feedback. So I have like a little Discord channel. You can get to it from the, the website, scholamonthly.com. And uh, yeah, share your feedback. I, I don't think that it's uh, a ton of people like following it yet, but it's it's been fun for me to kind of dive in with these libraries and put these together, so. R Ralph's asked, a CERC might be an interesting to look at, up, look at also. What was that? Ralph just said the CERC might be interesting to look at. I oh, guess gotcha. we're... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I really like doing them on libraries because I feel like there's a lot of really cool libraries that are out there. And uh, I, I feel like there's a lot of uh, work that goes into just maintaining them. And it can be hard to maintain your library and create a lot of content about how to use it at the same time. So um, yeah, trying to kind of get behind... Uh, more of that side of the open source community to hopefully give some more practical examples. Cause I know for me, some of these things were harder than others to learn uh, in terms of functional programming without, you know, certain like entry level examples. Great. Any more questions or discussions? Anyone? Twitch has gone a bit quiet compared to earlier. Great. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for the talk. It was it, it, it was a fabulous talk. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this talk here. Thank you, everyone on Zoom and Twitch for attending. And um, I'll be publishing the video for this uh, event quite soon, as I've had a lot of pings about when it's going to be published. So I think there's a lot. Of, you've got a big, keen following who want to see it. <laughs> so I'm hoping to get it out quite quite, quite quick. Um, uh, Thank you so much. And uh, if there's nothing else for us to discuss, I'll give the rest of the evening back to back to everyone. Thank you all. Thanks, all right. Jeff. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks, Thanks all. I appreciate it. Thanks all for joining. Really nice to see everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.